Hello. Can you hear me? I can't hear myself. What's going on? What do I need to do? I don't understand what I need to do here. So I go on chat. That doesn't seem to work. <laughs> what do I have to do in order to have my sound go on? My microphone seems to be on, my, my photo is on. What is the problem? I see recording here. You are using en enhanced encryption. <laughs> what is wrong? I see the recording thing. It says recording, it's a red light next to it. What do I have to do to get into the meeting? Maybe it's too early, it hasn't started yet. But usually I've been able to at least hear myself. I can't figure out what's not working. Inner minimal view, mute audio. I don't want to do that. Enter full screen. <laughs> Well, I don't want to do that. I've got, I like this list of participants. Well, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I can see myself, but I can't hear myself. Is it because a meeting hasn't started yet? Now it says Zoom meeting. And it says recording. Unmute. Stop video, I don't want that. I see the list of participants there. What do I need to do? Why is there no sound? Do I have to start over again? Oh, no, something's going on. Hi, why am I not hearing myself?
Hello. <laughs> Hello, how are you doing, uh, Ron? I hear you fine, okay. I'm Simon. Yes, but I'm not hearing myself. I'm seeing myself. Oh, you, you can't hear yourself? I can, but oh, I can't can. hear myself. And I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, wonderful. Yes. And Donna, nice to see you, Donna. Donna Good Paul. to see you, see Simon. Donna. Ron, this is, I'm going to say, this is the uh, Esperanto class for CGS. I'm going to stop, start taking place on June 11th. I'm going to stop the recording until we get to people. This is exciting. Mm -hmm. So um, I have resumed the recording. We are, this is the uh, CGS Esperanto class. The first one for June 11th of 2020. And uh, we're recording it. That we have one of our students um, is not able to join at all ever because of the time zone. And we'll try to record all the sessions. So if anybody misses a class, they can listen and get caught up. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and jump jump in with the agenda. The first agenda item is is to say welcome. We're just delighted to have all of you here. Welcome from Citizens for Global Solutions. Special thanks to uh, Barrett, whose idea this was and to Ron Blossop um, for being willing to take the lead, and for Jane Shepsoff and David Auten for supporting Ron. Thank um, you for setting it up. <laughs> so we thought, but you're welcome. We thought we'd go around and just, just everybody say the name, where you live, your level of knowledge of Esperanto. And actually, if you would add, if you've studied any other language, Ron said that might be helpful. So I'll get started. My name is Donna Park. I live in Cincinnati, um, and I know nothing about Esperanto other than I did listen to the recording that, that um, Ron suggested, and I, did, I studied French, so I, I used to know French fairly well, but not That's so much anymore. Um, so let's see, Simon, would you go next? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Simon Simonian, S-I-M-O-N-I-A-N. I live in Pacific Palisades and uh, in California, but uh, I have never studied Esperanto. Do you study other languages? Uh, yeah, I speak uh, Armenian, A-R-M-E-N-I-A-N, -E a very okay. ancient language. Arabic, I speak Arabic. Uh, wow. I speak Turkish, Turkish, and I speak uh, some French, uh, wow. and a little bit of English. Okay, well, you're doing very well with English. <laughs> Yes, you are. Uh, Leo Sandy, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm Leo Sandy. I live in Chesterfield, New Hampshire, and I, uh, I study Spanish, and I know a few words in Finnish. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, Mike M Matola. Hi, I'm uh, Mike from Long Beach, California, and uh, I've been... Uh, studying Esperanto for a couple of weeks on Duolingo. Okay. And I, had, I took three years of Latin. And, oh, wow. <laughs> and I've been studying Spanish off and on over the years. And I know quite a few words in Hawaiian. Good. Hmm. Jane. Hi. My name is Jane Shatsav. Um, <coughs> My native language is actually Russian, so I speak that in addition to English. I, I also studied Spanish in high school. And I've been studying and using Esperanto for a few years now. So I'm kind of intermediate level. And I, I, and I also started off with Duolingo and I do think that's a very good resource. Great. Thanks, Jane. And you live in the wanna, LA area, right? Yes, I live in Los Angeles. And I want to thank Jane for being ready to assist with the instruction whenever she feels like she wants to intervene and give us some information. Somebody who's learned English. I don't know if there's anyone else on the call who has learned English as a second language. I think uh, Simon has. I suspect Simon yes. and okay. Barrett. Right. Yeah, Simon and Barrett. Those of you who have learned English as a second language will have a better understanding of some of the difficulties 
between for English speaking people when they try to learn Esperanto. Okay, David Gallup. Hello, <laughs> Don. Uh, my name is David. I'm from Planet Otero, which is planet Earth. <laughs> but I happen to be in Washington, D.C. I'm at our office, and, and even on the World Passport, it's, there is some Esperanto. Monda Pasporto. <laughs> yeah. uh, in fact, it, it's, that's one of the seven languages that's on the World Passport, besides the six official languages. Um, I studied French. Je parle français assez couramment. I studied French, uh, one of my majors in college. Um, and wow. I, actually, I actually did give a speech uh, on Dr. Zamenhof's birthday back, uh, or, you know, celebration of his birthday to the uh, Esperanto Society of Washington, D.C. back in 1992. <laughs> but in relating, you know, the, the world language to world citizenship. But uh, I, I have to say, I really only know a few words of Esperanto at this point. That's a great beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Lawton. Um, I'm from St. Louis, and I've studied Latin and French. And I was able to take some basic Esperanto courses with Ron Glossop a number of years ago when he would come to my high school classes that I was teaching and uh, teach the students Esperanto. And Dave, I thank you very much for your readiness to help also, and especially for the materials that you sent to me that have become part of the course. There's five Great. lessons. Jim. Jim. Oh, uh, sorry. It's Jim Dimitrio from uh, Redondo Beach, California. Actually, my first language was Greek. We only spoke Greek in the household. I learned English as I went to school. Uh, I studied Latin and Russian as well. Uh, wow. Where we might share a little bit with our Armenian friend because uh, my family is from Constantinople and also spoke French and uh, Turkish, but I never did. <laughs> Thank wow. you. Wow, cool. Barrett. Well, <clears throat> hello. Uh, okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I'm from, you know, born and grew up in Bombay, India. And uh, my mother tongue is Gujarati. I learned Hindi. I also learned Sanskrit. And when I came to US to get my PhD, I had to have a second a profession language. So I learned German for two years. And of course, I speak English. <laughs> and I live I'm in, feeling. now I live in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, mm. neighbor to the big center of the world right now, namely <laughs> Minneapolis. <laughs> yeah. For about five miles away from where the tragedy yeah. took place. Mm. Um. Thank you, Barrett. Tom Hastings. And I'm Tom Hastings, live in Manhattan Beach, California. I studied Latin in high school and, and French. Uh, I don't speak them, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, and I've never done anything with Esperanto. Father Ben. Good background. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I studied uh, Latin. Uh, and uh, practiced Latin for several years. I took classes in Latin, took tests in Latin. I also studied Greek and a little bit of uh, French and, and Spanish. And you're living um, in uh, Michigan right now. Where you're in? I'm living. Where are you? Near Clarkston, Michigan. In, in Michigan. Uh, retirement home for Jesuits. Thanks, Ben. The other Tom, Tom Camarella. <laughs> You're on mute, Tom. Tom Camarella, can you mute yourself? Unmute yourself. Yep, you're still on mute. No, we can't. I can't see you. Uh, Brenda, we'll go to Brenda and come back to Tom later. Keep working on yourself, Tom, to unmute you. I got Brenda it. Birch. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Tom. Okay. I'm uh, Italian ancestry. My parents use that as the secret language. I took, <laughs> Latin. I took two semesters of Latin. I got a, a D and a C. I'm terrible. I'm dyslexic. 
I have a house in Italy for 14 years and I still can't speak the language. <laughs> I'm the dunce in the group. <laughs> but we do have four members from the LA group. So we have Simon, Jane, uh, uh, Tom Mike. and myself. And Jim. And how about, isn't and Mike Jim. and Jim? Oh, hi. hi, Jim. And Mike. And Mike. Isn't Mike too? Okay. Anyway. Uh, uh, he's William, uh, muted, uh, right? Okay, William Baker, can you introduce yourself? And do we call you William? Yes, that, that is great. Uh, yes, yeah, so I go, by, I go by William. So I am from North Carolina. Um, not a lot of language learning opportunities in North Carolina. So um, <laughs> always been pretty interested in languages. And I have dabbled on Duolingo for a while. I would not say I'm proficient by any means, but uh, happy to be part of the group and looking forward to uh, learning some good stuff. Great. We're really happy to have you, William. I think you bring down our average age significantly. Yeah. So, <laughs> thank you. I, I, William, are you by any chance a student? I am not. I, I am a full-time full worker. Yeah, I've, gra I've graduated college. Okay. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, good. Brenda's coming back. We had lost Brenda. Fred, Brenda, it's your turn to introduce yourself, uh, if you can. Mm. She doesn't have a microphone. Uh, Ron Glossop, you haven't introduced yourself, so would you introduce yourself? Well, I'm Ron Glossop, right now living in St. Louis, Missouri, and that is because that's where my wife is from. <laughs> but um, most of my life I spent teaching at the university level philosophy and peace studies. I did not hear about Esperanto until 1980, and then I became very active in Esperanto because I became very enthusiastic about the idea of a world language that is well designed, perfectly designed. In fact, that's one of the things I want to talk about at the very beginning, is why Esperanto is really unique, how different it is from other languages. Um, okay, Brenda, could you introduce yourself, Brenda, now that you're here and have a microphone, I think. Brenda, can you hear me? Oh, dear. Well, Brenda Birch lives in Cincinnati. <laughs> she's a dentist and trying to call in from her office, so she's having trouble. She doesn't know Esperanto at all. I don't know what other languages she might know, but English is her first language. So, okay. Um, with that, Brenda, anytime if you're able to talk, you can. I, I introduced you as best I could, Brenda. I, I just don't know if you know any other languages. Oh, shoot. Am I unmuted? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, we hear you. Okay. Uh, my, my service is very poor, so it's going in and out. Okay. The only thing is I, I did take Spanish in high school and college, and that's it for me, so... That's I have a little background. Okay. Great, great. We're glad you're here. Okay, so uh, uh, hopefully people have the agenda. The next item is just some logistics for this class. So uh, um, just if everybody doesn't know that you can get on gallery view so you can see all of us at one time, it depends on what device you're on. Sometimes gallery view is a, something you swipe on your, on a, if you're on a phone or a tablet. If you're on a larger laptop or, or larger computer, usually um, in the upper right hand corner, if you put the black around the black box around all our pictures, if you put your um, cursor up there, you might see that you could click on gallery view. If you see the word gallery view, it means you're not in gallery view. <laughs> you, you, you should see the word speaker view. And, and if you see it, you can click a couple times and see what it's like as you turn yourself. Also, if you're in speaker view, you might just see a matrix of nine a different, um, nine different, um, a, a matrix of three by three by three, nine dots in a matrix. Click that, that will get you gallery view. Um, we have a Google group. Um, who's, who just joined us? Esperantic Studies. Yeah. Hello, could you introduce yourself? Yes, let me change the name. This is Chuck Mays. I'm Ron Glossop's friend. 
uh, and Ron asked me to join, so I'm sorry I'm late. I'm That's okay. Welcome, Chuck. To assist Chuck, I'm it. very glad you're in the class. Maybe we can converse just a little bit to let people hear what that sounds like. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, I'll continue going through my logistics here. I'm not going through the logistics. So I created a Google group to, um, that will be used for sending out all of the information needed for this class. If you didn't get the email from that Google group and want to be added to it, you can send me an email at DonnaPark50 at gmail.com, or you can, I'll put it in the chat box, um, my, ad, my email address. But, or you could put your email in the chat box and I'll get it from there um, if you're not getting the email. Um, so we're going to meet on Zoom once a week in this time slot for the next eight weeks. So the last class will be on uh, Thursday, July 30th. So it will be this one hour time slot. We, as I said, we are going to record every session. So if you miss a session, you can listen to it. Um, the Zoom info will be the same every week. So if you ever can't find the current, the next one, and just use any of them, we'll always use the same Zoom link for this for this class. And also, I just want to say, if if you're if um, if you're not a member of Citizens for Global Solutions, I uh, ask that you consider uh, becoming a member. You can donate twenty five dollars on our website, globalsolutions.org. That would be awesome. Um, and Is with that, that awesome? I think. That, is that all? That's Just twenty-five dollars? Yeah, that's all. What a deal, huh? We'll take more. We'll you take can contribute more. <laughs> if you can give more, we'll take more. Yes, we're we're very careful with our money. We we only have one one employee. We have a couple contractors and mostly volunteers. So we money want goes to make far. It easy for young people. We want to make it easy for young people. Okay, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ron for the first class. Now, first of all, I want to say thank you, Donna, for getting this arranged. I am so glad that you were on it and getting us all set to go. Now, let me just say at the beginning, saluton, kai bonvenon al Esperanto. That would be translated as hello, and welcome to Esperanto. But let me notice something right there when I said saluton. That N on the ending is extremely important for English speaking people because it's something that we're just not used to. <laughs> In Esperanto, that N ending is on every direct object. And not only on the noun, but also all adjectives that go with that noun also have to have the letter N. And that's to tell you that it is an object and not a subject. If I would just say saluto without the N, that would just mean a greeting. It's only when I put the N ending on it that it means I extend to you a hello. I'm saying hello. Saluton tells you that. And then Kai is a very important word for and. A A J Kai is the word for and in Esperanto. Bonvenon is how you say welcome. And again, notice the N ending. Bonvenon. If I just said bonveno, that would mean a welcome. If I say bonvenon, that means I welcome you. Bonvenon. Bonvenon al Esperanto. I guess I want to begin by saying something that most of us do not think about, including I didn't think about it very much at the beginning. And that is when we talk about language, we usually think of language as a single thing. But in fact, every language is two things. It's a written language and a spoken language. And they, at the beginning, there was no written language. <laughs> For centuries, people went on without a written language. Language was only spoken. 
So when you got into written languages, it made a huge difference, a huge transformation. Up until then, how could you communicate with anybody except other members of your family <laughs> or neighbors? You could not communicate at a distance without writing. Writing made it possible to communicate at a distance and over generations. Over generations was a critical thing because that's how knowledge can grow. If you can only learn from your own generation, you're not going to learn very much. It's when you can learn from two, three, four, five, six generations that you start learning things and it really expands knowledge. So, and Esperanto is a unique, unique language in that it started out as a written language. Not many languages start out as a written language. It was developed by a teenager, Zamenhof, when he was in a, what we would call a preparatory school uh, to get into college. He came up with this idea because he lived in the town of Bialystok in northwestern Poland. In that community, there were four language groups. There were German-speaking people, there were Polish-speaking people, there were Russian-speaking people because it was part of the Russian Empire at that time, and then there were Yiddish people, and Zamenhof himself was Jewish. So there were already these four language groups and they would regularly get into violent conflicts with each other. And when Zamenhof was a teenager, he came up with the idea, you know, if they could just communicate with each other, I think it would really reduce the amount of violence. They could really talk to each other about what their concerns were. So he came up with this idea of developing a new language. He had studied Latin as a fifth grader. His father was an expert linguist who knew six or uh, Just a minute, Ron. Just a minute, yes. I, I, somebody suggested that I mute everybody and now I can't unmute Ron. So mute, Ron, can you unmute yourself? Can you, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, there you go. Your okay. So I have muted everybody else because there was some feedback on the line. Somebody sent me a, a chat. So everybody else is muted except Ron. So if you, when it's time, if you need to talk, you'll all need to unmute yourself when, if also, Ron asks you to. Go ahead, Ron. If you, if you want to get my attention, you can also put your hand up like this. And then even if you don't have your sound out, I can see that you want to say something and want to contribute to the conversation. Okay, I was talking about Zamenhof and how he came up with this idea of an, a language that would facilitate communication between people with different language groups. He had studied Latin in fifth grade because of his father's interest in languages. And he realized that the European languages for the most part were based on Latin. So he decided if he was going to develop an international language, he would start with Latin. And in fact, that's an important point. Esperanto is a Romance language. Esperanto begins with Latin. Now, Zamenhof was smart enough to realize most people are going to have a difficult time learning Latin. It's pretty complicated with five different uh, uh, you know, there's a nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and ablative cases. You got five different cases. In English, the only time that we see that happening is with our pronouns. Think about a little bit. I is the subject form. What's the object form? Me, a totally different word. And then what's the possessive form? My. Well, notice in English, that makes it more difficult for people to learn English. <laughs> Pronouns are one of the more difficult things because they have to learn the cases, the nominative, 
the genitive or possessive and the, the object of case. Now in Latin, you have in addition, the dative case, which is for indirect objects. Look at what happens in English when you say, I gave him the keys. What's him? Well, him seems to be the objective form of him, but it's actually a, a way of saying to him. So it's actually a, con, a concealed prepositional phrase. I give to him the keys, but I gave him the keys. Okay, so now in Esperanto, one of the things that happens over and over again is that you use an adverb instead of a prepositional phrase. So you can say, if you want to say, I want to speak in Esperanto, you can use it in a prepositional phrase like in Esperanto, English. I'm speaking in Esperanto. But in Esperanto, you can also turn it into an adverb, Esperanto. It's got an E at the end. Esperanto, mi non parolas Esperanto. I'm now speaking in Esperanto. Or if you want to put it more like English, I am now speaking esperanto -ly. <laughs> But that's the, w the usual way of doing things. If you want to say um, many things and, and prepositional phrases in Esperanto, you could use a prepositional phrase. You can always do that. But you can also make it shorter and just use an adverb. That does make it a little more complicated sometimes. Okay, so what else do I want to say here? I want to say that uh, because Zamenhof wanted his language to be used for international communication, and it was at a time when telephones had just been invented, not many people were using telephones, radio had not been invented yet. So if you're going to have people in different countries communicating with each other, how are they going to do it? The only way is in writing by letters. So that's why he decided his language has to be written at the beginning. But if people are going to speak the language later on, you've got to have rules for converting that written language into the spoken language. Now, some people wondered, what, well, could you really do that? Could you really spell things out in writing and then expect people to be able to communicate orally with each other? And Esperanto's themselves didn't know for sure whether it would work or not. The big event occurred in 1905 when it was decided to have an, an Esperanto meeting, a meeting of Esperantos from different countries, an international meeting in Northern France. And so we had people from 30 different countries who had learned Esperanto out of a book in written form. And they were astounded to find, oh yes, we can communicate with each other. It works. The very idea that Zamenhof had, putting it all in written form with strict rules, turned out that it did work. That you could start out with a written language and then it would also become an oral language. It's just the reverse direction of most languages. Most languages have started out as spoken languages. And only after that, many times centuries after that, have they become written languages. In fact, even today, when anthropologists are going out and looking at primitive and other uncivilized people, how do they determine if a group of people that they're just encountering is civilized or not? Anyone know? How do, how do you, if you're an anthropologist, how do you decide, is this group civilized or is it not civilized? 
is that very you see if, you could, if they write, if they can write, if they exactly have written language? Right. Uh, do they have a written language? If they have a written language, they're civilized. If they don't have a written language, they're uncivilized. It's just that ironclad rule. If you've got a spoken language and if you've got a written language, you got to have a written language because many, almost all groups, in fact, all groups have a spoken language. It's only the civilized groups that have a written language. Incidentally, in English, so if you're a native English speaking person, you probably haven't thought about the difference between the spoken language and the written language. But let me give you an example of a sentence. Suppose that I say to you, um, Ron, Ron, Tom Hastings is waving his hand, I think. Okay, what about sorry. the Egyptian hieroglyphics? Was that a written language or, or spoken? It was or? written, but it wasn't phonetic. Uh, it, okay. it was more, it's more, and Chinese is that, beginning Chinese, it's more like a picture language of drawings of a house or a tree or something representing a river. So there were languages and they had some kind of written, but it was pictures of things rather than phonetic. The Phoenicians, and that's the way the word phonetic comes from, the Phoenicians, somebody had already started up to come up with the idea of different letters having different sounds, but it wasn't regular. They, first of all, the Phoenicians were the first ones to say, let's have a correlation between the sound and the letter. Let's work out a thing where each letter has a sound. And it's at that point that you begin making a very important distinction for all languages. And that is the difference between consonants and vowels. What's the difference between a consonant and a vowel? Anyone know? Well, think of their consonant, b, pa, M, N, M. Um, the consonants require moving your lips. With vowels, you don't have to move your lips. You have to make a sound and you have to adjust down in your throat what that sound is. But in Esperanto, there are five vowels. In English, we would say E, a E I O U. Well, those are the vowels, but that's not how you say it in Esperanto. In Esperanto, you make the sounds that the vowels make. Ah, like in father. Eh, like in get. Eh, like in it. I'm, I'm sorry, in, in I, in E. In, in Esperanto, what we call I, in Esperanto and in your European languages is E. That's the simplest of the vowel sound. So it's A, E, E, O, U. Notice in Esperanto, I should, I should say in English, in English, when we talk about the long vowels, they are all really diphthongs. Now you've had a chance to read a little bit. Somebody want to tell us what, what is a diphthong? Okay, Chuck, did you want to say something? What's a diphthong? Yeah. No, I was just thinking that a, that a diphthong is when you, it's not a pure vowel. It moves from one vowel sound to the other or one vowel, exactly. from the vowel sound to another sound. Exactly right. A diphthong is two vowels slid together into a single syllable. Look at what happens when you say those long vowels in English. A, A, A. Actually, it's a slide from A to E, A, A. So in English, A is already a diphthong. I, I is already a diphthong. O. O oh, is already a diphthong. U is already a diphthong. 
some of you know Spanish. How do you say Cuba in Spanish? Cuba, Cuba. You don't have that U sound. That's that long. And you know, you can imagine this drives people crazy who are learning English for the first time because it has certain combination sounds that you just don't find in other languages. Or at least not the way that they are in English. Now you notice there, that means there is still one other vowel that is not a diphthong, and that is E. E is a pure vowel sound. The thing that's confusing that in Esmeralda, it's equivalent to our letter I. <laughs> So it's a, a, e, o, u. That are your five vowels. Okay, now, I guess at this point, you've already had a chance to read some material, and some of you have even done a little bit of studying of SMR. So I think at this point, it might be a, a good idea to ask does anyone have any questions that you would like to ask? something you would like to have us talk about, something that's puzzling to you, or something you would like to know about Esmeralda. If anybody has a question, you could either raise your hand figuratively or uh, using the little hand at the bottom or wherever there's hands. Uh, Simon, Simon has a question. Uh, uh, Zamenhof, what year did he begin to uh, create uh, Esperanto, what was the year and century? That is a good question. And we don't know the exact year. It was when he was in high school. The publication didn't come until 1887. The first published, and it had to be in some language, right? If you're gonna start a language that hasn't been used before, you got to have some other existing language that you're going to use in order to put forth your new language. So what was the language that he used? Jane? Yes. Russian. <laughs> yes. Well, because it was in the Russian Empire. And in eighty-seven, gonna... the Russian Empire was very influential, very powerful including controlling Poland. <laughs> so, Ron, so, Jane has more to say, Ron. Jane yeah. has more to say. Sorry. I yeah, um, I want to comment to people that probably one of the coolest and most useful features of Esperanto was actually inspired by Russian, and it's what um, you're gonna see that you can put together a lot of words by using a root and then various prefixes and suffixes. And that means you don't have to memorize the huge vocabulary that you do in a language like English. English is particularly bad at this because we just have a, we take words from everywhere and use them in slightly different ways and the vocabulary is enormous. And Esperanto has this feature that minimizes vocabulary memorization. There's always going to be some amount, but it's kept to the workable minimum. Hmm. Thank you very much, Jane. That's exactly why I'm so glad that you're helping out with the course. I didn't know about that myself. I guess I should say that in Esperanto, part of Esperanto seems to be a little bit like English. And that is because when Zamenhof went away to the university in Warsaw, his father, who thought the, the idea of an international language was a ridiculous idea, tore up all of his notes. So here he had gone off to Warsaw, the university, and all of his notes that he had left at home were no longer around. And why? His father said, come on, you're gonna study medicine. That's exactly what you should focus on. 
forget about this nonsense about this international language that you're thinking about. Now, his mother was very sympathetic. She had a better understanding of the humanitarian interests that, that, that Zamenhof had. But his father was already, as I said, his father already knew six or seven different languages. Why do you need an international language? You just learn a lot of languages like I did. <laughs> so <laughs> he, he started out with the idea that he would start from Latin and modify it. That was when he was in what we would call high school, secondary school. When he had gone to Warsaw, his father destroyed his notes. He had to kind of revise the language. And at that point, he had just studied English. And so he started making some modifications in his language in order to make use of English. And he found it especially useful when many of your different languages had too many words for, too ma for the same thing or very similar mm -hmm. words for the same thing. So, mm -hmm. for example, the word for fish. Zamenhof decided it's easier just to use English. The word for bird, it's just easier to use English. And so there are a few words in Esmeral that come right from English. And in fact, the more you use Esperanto, the more you realize how much Esperanto has been influenced by that knowledge of English that Zamenhof had done. Um, I, have a, I have a question, it's a detailed question. Is that okay from my yeah. listening to, the, listening to the, the recording you asked us to listen to oh, plus what? reading your notes? I, I'm confused about how to pronounce the, pronounce the diphthong that is um, hmm, eh, in English. Eh, oh, ooh. E, 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 with you with a little hat on it. E, 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 yeah, with the hat. It, yeah, e, how, how to. E, e, and that comes in the word neutrala, neutral, neutrala, or in e, e, Europa. E, e, Europa. Because it, it, in the recording, I kept getting more like an ah. Uh, Oh, uh, oh, but I I don't know. So it's EU, it's AU. 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 Okay, thank you. Um I also wonder um if I, if we could take a screenshot of this class for it right now if everybody would be willing to sort of get yourself in if Jim and and William would be willing to turn your cameras back on for a minute if that's possible. And Brenda, if you could get closer in and everybody sort of smile, I'm going to do a screenshot because it's maybe we can write a little article about this for our website. So, okay, ready? Everybody smile at your camera, wherever it may be. One, two, three. Thank you. Okay, back to you. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions that anyone has? Well, it looks like Dave has a question. Well, I guess there's two days. Okay, Dave Auden. I think it would be very helpful for most people to start with the pronunciation of the Esperanto letters. And everybody should have uh, that printed out, hopefully, and actually hear you say, Ron, each letter, along with the diphthongs. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I'm ready to do that. I see, though, Dave Gallup also had a hand up. Dave Gallup, do you have a question? Yeah. So I just, does uh, Esperanto have a way to bring in new words, colloquial words or expressions or things like, you know, are so used to people using in text now like LOL, you know, for laugh out loud. Does, does right. Esperanto have a new a way to gain new words? And, and, um, and As a matter of fact, there are ways to make new words and there are new words coming all the, way, all the time because there are new things. Like there were no computers at the time that Esperanto was invented. So there's always been the problem, how do you say computer in Esperanto? It's a very interesting history because among other things for inventing new words, Esperanto has this whole set of rule guided prefixes and suffixes, which you'll find on the third page of the introductory materials. The Suffix elo, spelled I-L-O. Elo means 
an instrument for doing something. So manjilo is an instrument used for eating, a utensil. Uh, so computilo was one of the regular words that was used for a computer, an instrument for computing. Other people said, well, but there are other instruments used for computing, <laughs> not just computers. So maybe we should have a different. So they wanted to go with the English. And that is also what happens sometimes. You want to go back to English. Computer. So for a long time, there was an indication, a, a, a problem in SML. How do you say computer? Do you use computilo or do you use computero? And the one that won out by this having most people want to use it is computilo. So that is the word now that's used regularly for computer. But obviously there are a bunch of whole a whole bunch of new words connected with computers that did not exist. And that's why you do have to, nowadays, even for me, have to have a, a newer dictionary because there are new words coming into use all the time. Ron, Barat has a question. Yes. Barat, Barat. Barrett, can you, Barrett, can you, un yeah. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. You know, I like that idea of Ron, you're pronouncing each of the letters, but I'd like to add something to it. I'm reminded of when I was uh, growing up, uh, in a kindergarten, and the way I learned a new language was the teacher would say the letters or words, and we repeated it. And the teacher would respond saying, ah, you know, you didn't get this right. You, you got to yeah. do it that way. And somehow that repetition kind of created well, a memory. That. Maybe we should try that, combine these ideas. I will go through the alphabet. I will say the letters like you would if you were saying the alphabet in Esperanto. The way you say the Esperanto alphabet, you pronounce the vowels the way they sound. The consonants, you pronounce with the sound that a consonant makes, followed by O. Oh. O. Oh. So, A ah would be what we would in English call the letter A. Ah. Ah. And B. Ah. The letter B is, is very much like English. B. B. Oh. The letter C is very much like T-S in English. So. 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 Sure. The C with a mark over it is equivalent to a C-H. And that's one of the big things that, that Zamenhof did. He said, we don't want to have something like they have in English where you have to see combinations of letters. If you got CH or SH, then in any case you pronounce the C and the S differently. He said, no, let's not go that way. So what he did was to use this upside down V to indicate that this letter has a special sound that you don't find in English or in other languages. So the C with the mark over it is like an, like a CH, like in chair. So the way you would say it in saying the alphabet is cho. 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 Do, e, fo, go, jo, ho, and now the only sound we don't have in English, ho, it's kind of an H sound like in halachloman, uh, or in, in, in German, ich, ich, ich. So it's a, and, and in English, we do have a couple of words like Hanukkah that have that very first letter in some languages is pronounced that way. Ron, if I might interject, that yeah. ha, ho sound is not used very often in this room. Yeah, that, thank you, Chuck. That is a good point. It's fortunately not used very often. 
but it is used sometimes, so you do know, need to know how to use it when it is there. Okay, back to the alphabet. E, yo, jo. Now comes the easy part, no marks, ko, lo, mo, no, o, po, ro. Now, if you can roll the R a little bit, like in Spanish, that's even better. Ro, ro, ro. So, show, to, u, and here's another interesting letter, wo. Now, when you say wo, oh, that sounds like a W. Yeah, when well, you look at it, it is a W. It's one U over a U <laughs> instead of one beside another. And, you know, many people don't realize in Latin, they shifted back and forth between U and V. And sometimes they would use U and sometimes they would use V. And, and so <laughs> the idea that the W would be pronounced like wa wa is like a U with drawn out a little more. But in Eskimo, you would just say whoa, whoa is, whoa. but it's a different mark than you have over the consonants because it is a vowel. The U with that brev over it is another whoa. vowel. And then vo and zo. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, let me go back. I'm wrong. That's not right. That woe is not a vowel. Ooh, the U or ooh is a vowel. The woe is not, it's a kind of a semi vowel. It is only used in different songs. Ow, ew, I. Okay, now let, let me go through the alphabet again and let you pronounce it after you hear me pronounce it. Ah. 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 Bo. Bo. So. 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 Cho. 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 Do. 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 Eh. Eh. Bo. 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 Go. 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 Joe. 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 Ho. 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 E. 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 Yo. 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 Jo. 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 Ko. 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 Lo. 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 Mo. 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 No. 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 Oh. Oh, 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 ro, 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 so, so, show, show, to, 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 Oh, Simon, um, uh, at this early, uh, Ron, by the way, thank you so much uh, also for uh, teaching us the basics, um, which you did so clearly. Um, at this early stage, Esperanto is practiced among the 195 countries that we have in the world yes. with 7.5 billion people. How many people, you know, are able to converse or know about the basics of Esperanto in the world today. Do you have an idea? Well, the estimate is about a million. Uh -huh. but there are all kinds of disagreements about that. And one of the problems is how do you decide when a person is competent enough with hey. Esperanto to so be counted? <laughs> go, Joe. But when you go to an Esperanto meeting, you can tell there are some people who are much more proficient in speaking Esperanto than others. You also become aware that the one language group, 
that has the most difficulty getting rid of their accent is who? The French. The French. The, the, the French have their very unique ways of pronouncing vowels and combinations. And so the French have a more, a more difficult time than most in getting rid of their accents. English speaking people, now maybe it's partly because I'm English speaking, but it seems to me like the English speaking Esperantists are among the easiest Esperanto speakers to understand. Now it's partly because, but, but they're also uh, very famous. Some, some of the people who are English native speakers who have become Esperanto, like Humphrey Tonkin, who was president of the Universal Esperanto Association for a long time. Humphrey Tom Tonkin uh, is uh, regarded as one of the most expert Esperanto speakers. And he often gives lectures at meetings that are held every year, the Universal Congresso, every year at the end of August or the first part of September is the Universal Congresso. This year it was going to be in Montreal because of the pandemic, it was called off and it will be two years before it will be in Montreal again. Next year, it will be in Finland. Um, Ron, I would, um, we only have another minute left and I would like to take another picture. I accidentally had all the participant name list up and I'd rather just have our pictures. And now we have Father Bob Hurd joined us too. Bob, welcome Bob, you weren't with us when we did our introduction. Yes. Father Bob also lives in Cincinnati and um, is a professor at Xavier University and a, a colleague of Ben's is another Jesuit priest with us. So, okay, thanks everybody. Sorry, but um, if everybody smiles at their camera, this one's gonna be great, I think. I, okay, ready? One, two, three. Smile, thank you. Okay, but we our time is just about up. Maybe people, some people might need to leave. So if you have to hang up, feel free. Um, remember, we'll meet the same time next week. I'll send out an email with uh, instructions from Ron. Um, and I don't know if you want to say anything else before people might have to go, Ron. Any well, last I minute words? That one of the things that's been distributed is this list of words that are, uh, you, it starts out with B U C and then C with a mark over it, O R, then Z U M. And so, in each case, you're supposed to fill in an English word based on how the Esperanto letters are pronounced. For the first one, B-U-C, how would you pronounce that? Book. Boots. B-O-O-T-S. <laughs> Boots. Oh. The next right. one would be chore. C -A chore, I got that one right. C H O R E. The next one is very easy. Zoom. Zoom. Z O O M. Zoom. And the fourth one is the most difficult one in the whole list, I believe. It's Chin. not Shin. Because how does that letter I get pronounced in Esperanto? E Sheen. It's going to be Sheen. Like the shine of clothing. So that fourth one is the most difficult one. The other, so that's exactly what you should do for next week. And then you we'll have more in our discussion. What are the are right you gonna answers? have more homework? Well, that's the homework for next week. Okay. Thank you. Also, there's other written stuff that um, you've already been told about other lessons that you can go to and so on so and i'll always try to begin by asking questions at the very beginning do you have any questions about anything i see jane's hands up and the, and also dave Otten. jane um one thing that you might find useful especially if you have to start exploring is to go on duolingo.com and yes. try it out. It's a it's an interactive step-by-step -step, uh, 
introductory course. They have lots of languages, including Esperanto. And there's several of us here who started off that way. So if you want to explore a little bit before the next class, I, I do recommend it. Great. Dave Otten's hand Dave also was up. Dave, very quick. Dave. Say bird in Esperanto. Yes. Beardo. Beardo. Not birdo. Not birdo. <laughs> it's like B E E R D O. I guess another thing we ought to mention is that <laughs> O sound. Very often, what English speaking people do is pronounce it as a diphthong. O, O, and you want to avoid that if you possibly can. Barrett has a question. I just want to. Uh, have a clear clarification of the website that Jane said we could go through. I didn't uh, quite catch um, it. I'll put it in the chat box. Oh, great. Thank but, you. Uh, also, you can just go uh, look for search Duolingo Esperanto. D U O L I N G O Esperanto. And do your search. Bye bye everyone. Bye Tom. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank Any other questions for, for um Ron? Yes. Nope. Any other questions? I was just asking if anybody else had any questions. But oh, Tom Hastings does. Is, is there a phonetic? It's totally phonetic that you can, that you can use to 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 see how you how to pronounce something. Or not? Well, I don't know that phonetic alphabet. I do know what I was taught and how to pronounce the Esperanto letters. Right. And so now I just if, use the Esperanto letters. <laughs> Tom, if you use the link, there's a link in in the first email that went out from that um, Ron suggested we listen to, and the guy goes through the alphabet, and you know it's it's very it's very good. I okay. thought it was good. I'll, I'll do Help that. me, Thanks. except I just, I'm still struggling with, but I, I'm slow at languages, so. I think but also, everybody, anybody that wants to send me an email message, it's R-G-L-O-S-S-O-P -S -S at MindSpring, M-I-N-D-S-P-R-I-N-G dot com. And I like using email. I got oodles of messages these days, but that's the easiest way for me to communicate. I like email. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Ron, and everybody for being here. This, we'll see you next week. This was a miraculous, uh, thank you. Uh, miraculous and I, intimate lesson uh, of 16 participants, 17 participants with Zoom. And thank you, Donna. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Jane, and thank you everybody for their questions. It was very enriching. God bless you. See you next week. And in the bye bye. Dancon. Dancon is the way you say thank you. Dancon. 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 Dancon.